born in New Zealand will arrive prematurely. Medical advances mean that our neonatal units can now save babies from as early as 23 weeks. But up to half of those babies born extremely prematurely will have some form of lasting disability. It's about survival. We are able to keep babies alive much, much younger age. When I was born, um, we would be lucky to be keeping 28 or 30 weekers alive, and now we're routinely keeping 24 weekers. And even, that doesn't sound a lot, that's just a month, but that's a huge development in, in the baby. The biggest risk that we worry about is, is, of course, to the brain and to brain development. And the sorts of things that can happen when a baby is born extremely preterm and the brain is affected are things like cerebral palsy. You also, in that group of babies as a whole, have a lot of other significant developmental issues. So we're keeping those babies alive and they, of course, have this significant burden of neurological problems. Those sorts of things are more common in this group of babies, probably because they've wired up in a slightly different way. Baby Erica was born at 26 weeks gestation. For the first month of her life, she's teetered on the edge. When she was born, she wasn't breathing, but they managed to get her all under control pretty quickly. Yeah, she was tiny, absolutely tiny. Sort of seeing her and realising that, you know, she should have still been inside me. And, um, hmm, yeah, that she was okay. And it was just, yeah, overwhelming, really. Yeah. At six days old, Erica was airlifted out of Quake Strip in Christchurch to Auckland. It's only as the milestones come round that they'll have any sense of whether there's been a cost. We'd gone up here on the Wednesday and then the yeah, first cuddle that we had with her was on the Sunday. And then the day after that, she had a wee bit of a down time and um, was struggling a wee bit with her breathing and with her oxygen. Um, and so, you know, you'd sort of gone from this really happy, emotional moment to, you know, not actually being able to even, like, do her cares because she was having, you know, really tough time um, with any sort of stimulation. Hello there, Selena. How's it going? Good. Yeah, yeah. Sleeping family. Yeah, yeah. So it's about time for cares, is that right? Yes, yeah, cares yeah, are too. On, I think it was Friday and Saturday, she was lasting all um, the whole cares without her CPAP and um, then sort of went a wee bit, wee bit down oh, on Sunday. Yeah. But um, apparently this morning she lasted the whole cares as well, so it's about half an hour yeah. with no CPAP, so that's good. Hopefully she'll be fine down here. Excellent, thank you. With the help of permanent oxygen, Erica's held on. Even at a month old, she's quarter the weight of the average newborn. But there are likely to be some developmental delays. Okay, thanks. A lifetime working with premature babies truly makes Simon Rowley the expert. Hello. How's it going? Well, not too bad today. She's fast asleep. Um, yes, yeah, no, she's been, um, been pretty good today. She's a little bit up and down after feeds, but yeah. otherwise. Doctors are now attempting to save babies as early as 23 weeks, but no medical professional is ignorant of the risk. <laughs> and everything else we're really pleased about. She seems to respond well to the steroids. Yeah, yeah, and um, her colour's been good and things. I haven't noticed anything from a non-medical perspective that's too much of a worry. <laughs> okay. You never want to not resuscitate a baby who might have had a perfectly good life and a good quality of life. But on the other hand, you don't want to resuscitate a baby needlessly who is going to end up living with a dreadful quality of life. And you have to draw a balance between how you project their outcome. And that is very hard. Parents are given an overwhelming list of complications that their new son or daughter might have. 
each morning when we come in, my husband brings me in and we um, we hear for the doctor's rounds each morning and you never know when you come in whether the news is going to be, oh yep, she's still doing well, you know, as it, fortunately it's been for a few days. And we're just hoping that she doesn't slide back. Or when you're going to come in and overnight she's had a temperature or that kind of thing. So it's a real roller coaster and you actually don't know, you can't control how your own day is going to be and you certainly can't control how well your baby's day is going to be, so you just have to go with the flow. Oh, we try and be pretty honest right at the start. We have a discussion when we can about the sorts of things they might expect in terms of problems along the way, both acutely in the unit and then long term. And so all parents are told that there is a risk of brain damage, there's a risk of other system damage as well, like chronic lung changes and having to go home on oxygen, having to have a, a heart operation maybe, having bowel problems where you might need a bowel operation. So we warn them all about that and we warn them about the outcomes. Um, but you have to keep coming back to that because parents you know, have, are in a difficult state at the time their babies are just new. What they are focusing on is survival at all costs. And so you're then left with worrying about um, you know, whether they really have listened to what you're saying. <laughs> There was a wee booklet that I got given um, a wee while ago and um, there is a risk um, with her being preterm um, that she can develop um, problems with like sight and hearing, um, with fine motor skills and with general movement. Um, but it's all, you know, sort of ifs and maybes. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. And I think you, you tend to block out things that you're not ready to hear. So we have to go back and repeat that. So you do sometimes hear the parents say, well, actually, we didn't really take in what you were saying, or you never told us, when in fact we did tell them. And that's just the way it is. Professor Laura Bennett is a fetal physiologist. She heads the team of PhD students researching ways to improve outcomes for babies. They're looking at samples from sheep brains, researching whether they can help developing brains by adding doses of melatonin, a naturally occurring hormone that regulates biological functions like sleep. Oh, they're looking really nice. Good stain. Beautiful, bright. So we're seeing really, really good changes in there. So you'd be really happy with that, Paul? I'd say so, yeah. yeah. Looks good. Perfect. Oh, it's fantastic. Many babies um, at that age, um, I think people look at them and they think, ah, oh, it's just really small but perfectly formed and we, and we just want that baby to grow up and put some weight on. But that's not the case at all. They're halfway through their development and that means all of the organs, not just the brain, uh, are still waiting to grow populations of cells and to mature those cells in terms of their function. And we really don't do that till well past 30 to 35 weeks of gestation in most organs. And of course the brain continues to grow and develop um, after birth. The decision to keep resuscitating is sensitive. At times, doctors are working on pure instinct as they determine what chance that baby might have. We want to be able to support babies if they need us, but if they're telling us that they're just not capable of surviving, we shouldn't keep them alive at all costs. Who's your closest friend here? Keegan Lewis is a cheerful 15 year old. He was born at 26 weeks. Loved by his parents, they admit they had no understanding of what Keegan's premature birth would have been for him or them. resuscitated at birth, then at least twice more during his 12 weeks in hospital. How's that, man? What are uh -huh. some of the things that you find, you know, they're a little bit hard about having cerebral palsy? Is there anything that you... Well, um, basically, uh, I've um, had, um, to, for people to understand me, the first photo that was ever taken. It's a lot of pain. Oh, 
wasn't an easy time for anyone. I don't, I don't really think you have time to think or feel. Um, just, um, I mean, you're young and you're not prepared and you're wondering what is happening. Um, in hindsight, knowing what I know now, I would have had a lot of questions to ask <laughs> around everything. Um, I remember thinking, this cannot be happening. He's not ready. Look at the size of the nappies. They come up to his neck. So I, I, I think the information at that time for us as parents was, was non-existent. And, and you know, I was pretty much like Frankie. We weren't. 100% sure of what was going on. We weren't given any sort of outcomes or guidelines or, or kept up to speed with what was happening. It was just happening, and when it did happen, it happened very, very quickly. Keegan is one of the 5% of very low birth weight babies who has a severe disability. No one can say exactly when Keegan's brain was damaged. He lives with cerebral palsy. I, I think if, if, if we were given the opportunity 15 years ago to make a decision whether resuscitate or not resuscitate, well then that's the decision that we live with. We're now living with a, uh, a, a, the result of a decision that was not ours. When he was born, early indications were that he would develop normally. But at nine months, he was given a diagnosis. His parents just didn't realise that in saving Keegan, there could be such lasting impacts. Keegan needs full care around the clock. Oh, I don't want to know my next bit. Exactly. You can lie flat out on your bed. You don't have to be The family is supported by part-time caregivers, but at times, the battle for support overwhelms them. 99% of the stress that we come across on a daily basis is not caring for Keegan. I mean, that's easy. That's enjoyable. It's the, it, it's the rubbish we have to deal with, with all these so-called people that know better and on and an guidelines. agency and policies that are onerous and not working, but we still insist that you stick to those policies. That's oh, just a crock. <laughs> Do you want to do what you're told? No. No, I didn't when I was 15 either. They spoke to us honestly and said other young parents will not be aware of what lies ahead if their child is severely affected with prematurity. I think parents and, and siblings of, 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 of premature kids need to, um, need to be supported within that because there's not a lot out there. And as I say, the toll on families is huge. It really, really is because the parents are so committed to, to doing what's right, um, usually at, at huge expense to other family members. So, you know, it's, it's, yeah, it's a life-changing event, it really is. And parents need to be aware of that. They really, really do. You're going to be coming up against organisations that clearly have no idea about what it's like to support someone with severe impairments or high complex needs. Also think that Technology and, and the knowledge that the medical profession has now is creating disabilities. They're creating an influx of, of impairments that clearly the likes of Ministry of Health and other support agencies just can't deal with. Yeah, that's the other thing. You're really hairy, like little monkeys. What are you really hairy? Mm. <laughs> you 
though prematurity has resulted in some learning difficulties. Rebecca Bear feels lucky to have her children Thomas and Bella, both born at 23 weeks. You still had all of this, all of the stuff to help you breathe. Still, you put in the monitor. They're not yet old enough to truly understand the miracle of their survival. Until I could breathe alone without. Until you breathe all by yourself here about three months without any extra help. But it got less and less all the time. At the end, there was only just a little bit of oxygen, extra oxygen for you. You remember the photo with um, Daddy's wedding ring up your arm? Oh, yeah. Can you imagine how tiny your little arm was, hey? Your ring. The outcome is better than Rebecca expected. She was told Thomas would be severely affected. And what is that saying? Oh, my arm. When you look at your, the size of your head compared to my finger size there, my finger was way bigger than your head, wasn't it? At the time, Rebecca felt powerless. She was kept from cuddling Thomas and grieved the early bond they would experience had he been full term. Uh, yes, I think there's an aspect of grief, absolutely. Um, grief guilt, shame, in lots of ways. For me, there was a guilt about um, not feeling more grateful for what had happened for me. Um, on the other side was, you know, the loss, I suppose, of something that could have been. So my inability to just say, OK, well, this is what happened, wasn't due to anything I did or didn't do. It's just one of those things, here we are. Well, that was my first cuddle with Mum. And I think Mum said I had 65 days in hospital. I was almost as big as this, but just a little bit small, smaller. The chauffeur unfolded the letter and began to read. Dear sirs, I saw you notice as I drove by this morning. I've been looking for a decent... Forewarned that her children would have deficits, Rebecca made early choices about health and education to give them the best chance to recover. Both children go to a Steiner school. It's been the right call. Thomas needs a specific style of learning. She still worries about him the most. While he doesn't have a severe disability, he gets anxious and learns differently to other children his age. Probably the biggest thing emotionally I see for him is that he has ideas that other children just aren't aware about um, in the way that he... He's extremely aware of what goes on around him and he, he judges himself um, heavily. Um, so he won't um, put himself into a situation where um, he doesn't think he completes something. So he won't pay a group sport, for example. He won't join in with groups. Um, and he often becomes fearful in situations and has anxieties that other children just don't appear to have. So physically, um, he was very, he's always been very, very slow to meet his milestones. He's very small for his age, but still within the normal spectrum, if you like. Um, and he has had very low energy levels. The first one. Oh, do you remember the... I do <laughs> remember that. That was just after you were born. That one. Do you remember? Uh, no. No? <laughs> I mean, my ex-husband and I laugh because it's, um, you know, we talk about never being concerned about paying our taxes anymore because uh, they, my, you know, our two little babies are million dollar babies. They just had hundreds and thousands of dollars poured into them and all the technology, which was so, so, so grateful for. Twenty-five years ago, being born at 24 weeks was at the very edge of viability. When Amy Hogan arrived, she was given a 5% chance of surviving. She weighed slightly more than a pound of butter. I was born at 24 weeks, which is, it doesn't take a level of rudimentary math to know that 40 weeks and 24 weeks is a significant difference. 16 weeks premature is extremely prim, particularly in 1986. It was probably on the cusp of the level of neonatal intervention that they could do successfully. 
Mum was given some fairly grim statistics about whether I would survive. But Amy Hogan did survive. And while she has cerebral palsy, she has also completed a university degree majoring in psychology. She is considering a master's degree and works part-time as a researcher at the Cerebral Palsy Society. She's keenly interested in the effects prematurity has had on her own life. Well, there's a, there's a, a very much a syndrome that comes along with in the wider public consciousness of the miracle babies. And people find it very difficult to let miracle babies grow up in a sense that people quite like the mythology of the miracle, so they don't really like the nitty and gritty of the reality thereof. And a lot of the reality isn't particularly pretty. Amy's family nickname is Birdie, from the time when she looked so small and fragile. But really, she spent her lifetime defying that. But she's the first to acknowledge that she's had to develop coping skills to get there. For example, I have what's known as synesthesia, which means that I see numbers and words and colours. So I use that to my advantage when trying to learn things like the times tables and count measures, frequency counts. So I just assign them different colours. And so I use whatever bizarre sensory crossover I had to my example, advantage. Okay. Not she lists other effects of prematurity, okay. a heightened sensitivity to pain and full-blown allergic reactions to things as minor as rough well, fabric. Quite a bit of Evidence of the different yeah. pathways okay. the brain develops. Jodie Hogan says it's only now that she can look back and acknowledge her own journey. My way of trying to gain control was to try and become an expert and trying to become way too much, trying to take on too much and I, I can recognise it now that that was, that was my way of trying to get the control back and of course the trick is, which I've only very recently learned and Amy would probably be able to speak to this quite well too, is you, you work so hard at trying to be that person that, that the, the hardest part then is letting it go and, and, and just letting go, being all of those people and then just, just being able to be her mother. Just putting your um, breakfast out on the table up here, Beth. Okay, thanks, Mama. There we go. I'm just going to go and grab my cup of tea. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, getting into early autumn weather. I mean, you can't say to doctors, hey, my life is valuable. Yeah. Because they know that. And Misty. And Misty, and you can. A lot of these babies are living. But what are the outcomes for these babies? What are the outcomes for their families, for society? I think in the last 10 years, we've all come to accept that um, quality of survival is, is equally important as um, absolute survival. I'm not going to draw any judgment on the value of my life versus not my, not my life or all those kind of questions, but I just say that to always have hope and always have optimism, because you're the fighter for these babies, and always err on the, on the side of optimism and energy because I'm sure it must be an incredibly intense, incredibly emotionally driven experience being a doctor and being a professional in, this, in the unit but come from a position of hope because hope does bear fruit with people like me and the countless others who are premium and have come out of it. Surviving extreme prematurity is not the rarity it once was. In New Zealand, 8% of all babies are premature arrivals. There's a reason we're born at 40 weeks and not 24 weeks. It's an important thing that we've missed out on, and that needs to be acknowledged once you're in the frame of mind to do it as a young adult, or even as a younger child. Just when you're ready, and when the circumstances around you are ready, become mindful of who you are as a premature, child and as a premature young adult. Yeah, I don't think you'd be a um, 
and responsible neonatologist if you didn't actually worry about those decisions that you're making all the time. And uh, you always think about them. Um, on the other hand, I'm also aware that we're not God and that we don't have to take responsibility in, you know, for what's going to happen, um, regardless of what we do. So although I worry about it and I think about it, and I talk about it with the junior staff a lot, um, I also think that we've got a responsibility to ourselves to actually um, sit back a little bit and say we can only do the best we can. It was never going to be the story that, that perhaps we thought it was going to be. But conversely, I would never possibly imagine it could be the enriched story that it has been. You know, Amy's probably motivated everything that I've done in my life now in the most wonderful way. <laughs> so there's nothing I could change. Thanks to all the families involved for sharing their stories. If you want to find out how you can support New Zealand's premature babies and their families, go to neonataltrust.co.nz. This event is a World Cup and it's, it's one of the qualifying events that we need to attend. Oh, I'd absolutely love to go home with a medal. Yeah, this is, this is great. I want to keep this going until at least London. It's all about points for New Zealand to qualify for the Paralympics. I'm going to go into this race as I go into all of my races, confident that Sonia and I are going to put our utmost into it and we're going to come out with a little medal. so proud to win this award. Nominations for this year's awards are now closed and the judges have begun their deliberation. They're an outstanding bunch of guys. On behalf of us all, thank you very much. To secure your seat on the night, go to www.attitudepictures.com forward slash awards.